So we will be finishing. Yeah, it's almost in Tokyo. It's okay? Yeah. <laughs> Should we? No. <laughs> okay, so good afternoon, everybody. I think it's working. And it's my great pleasure to introduce our today's speaker. I'm doing it not only for you, because you're in the Zimbabwe, but also for our public everywhere in the world. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> 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 yeah, from home to the world. Uh, well, Zimbabwe Blau uh, is, uh, I would say, the living legend of the studies about architecture, art, and liturgy. Um, he's, well, the author of this book, which is also sort of legend, Kultus e Decor, which was translated from Neerlandish to Italian and appears in 1994, if I'm right. And which was also his dissertation, that's right. So, and there is a book really crucial about uh, the relationship between space, in the, the main Roman basilicas, and liturgy. And after that, Zibla became really the authority in this, in this field, but not only Rome. So, he extended uh, from Jerusalem to, I would say, Italy, basically all the Mediterranean. And um, his studies are always great. And, uh, a part of those that he was an incredible, amazing, nice man. And uh, he's also one of the supporting friends of our Center for Living Last Studies in Brno, which is also a great honor. By the way, I think I could say it officially that Sibla will be the first Hans-Gai Book Fellow in Brno this autumn from November to December. So we have this connection together. And he joined us here in um, Kong uh, to speak about something which apparently is not completely linked with what we are doing, but is the second part of our project. On one hand, we are working on what we are meeting. On the other hand, we will get a series of functional conferences and lectures, lectures, more conferences, um, about questions which are closely linked with the phenomenon of pilgrimage and with the movement of persons in the Middle Ages. So, since Zimla is a big specialist of Rome, uh, I propose this beautiful conference, lectures about pilgrimage to Rome before 1000 AD. So we will be now in Rome, and we will try to discuss and think about pilgrimages. But uh, what's also for us crucial as part for the, let's say, global aspect of the pilgrimages is really to identify and touch the common anthropologic phenomena which are linking the different steps of the phenomenon of pilgrimages, and Rome is a crucial place. So thank you. Thank you, Ivan, for, for your kind words of introduction and, and for the invitation. It, it is really a privilege for me to join you in this extraordinary <coughs> yeah, experience and in this extraordinary place. But I hope you are ready to uh, broaden the perspective a little bit from Sainte Foy to the city of Rome. But you have already heard of Pascal II the, the this morning, a pope um, who is a little bit later than the period I will be talking on, but he is standing in the long tradition and uh, also a tradition of connections between Kong and Rome. But more important, I think, is the connection between, between uh, Kong and Rome still in the um, phenomenon of pilgrimage. And it's, it's about pilgrimage to Rome that I want to, uh, to talk to you. And um, let us first have a look at the late antique empire, because when you talk about Christian Rome, you have to, to start early. Um, very early when you compare it to uh, the flowering period of Kong. But uh, anyhow, um, things that are really in, connections, in connection to each other. This is the, um, the Roman Empire in late antiquity. Uh, and the, the map shows it, the uh, extent of Christianization in two different stages. Uh, the pink stage is, let's say, the situation in the first part of the fourth century, so the period that Constantine uh, becomes the first Christian emperor of the Roman Empire. And the green part is uh, the situation uh, after the first movement of Christianization of Europe, uh, about 600. And you see uh, Gallia, for instance, is completely already uh, Christian, Frankish Christian then. Um, what kind of sources do we have on the earliest pilgrimage of Christians? Um, I think these uh, fourth century sources are crucial to the understanding of the phenomenon in Christian tradition. Uh, the first one is Eusebius, 
the famous historian that has written a history of the church uh, in the first three centuries, but also a history of the life of Constantine, which is really very positive, of course, about the first Christian emperor. Um, but uh, this Eusebius is very much interested in the sites of Christian history. So where did the biblical events take place? And in all his texts, there is uh, a specific attention for these sites of uh, biblical events, sites of, I would say, theophany, where Christ and God um, uh, reveal themselves. So sites in the Holy Land, because that's what he uh, is really speaking on when he deals with uh, the topography of, uh, of the history of the Church. And um, another two important sources are let's say, reports about um, journeys to the Holy Land from the 4th century from people from Gallia, so from where we are now. Um, one of Bordeaux, 333, and one a lady, we know her name even, Egeria, uh, in the later 4th century. And both reports of, uh, of these journeys um, attest to the fact that the phenomenon of pilgrimage did exist in the 4th century and that it is a phenomenon that has already uh, taken on a certain tradition. Where do they go to? Of course, the most important place, and I will not discuss it too long because it will be later in your program, but um, only to, uh, to recall it to you, the most important places, of course, were Jerusalem and Bethlehem. And the interesting thing is that uh, the first Christian emperor, Constantine, is building uh, big, pretentious complexes just on these sites. So it simply confirms the significance of these sites for Christian history, but also the significance as a goal of pilgrimage. Um, we see the Holy Sepulchre in uh, Rome, and we see the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem, which is very uh, hypothetical, and the, the reconstruction would be a little bit different already now, but that does not interest us now in detail. Uh, only to recall you, this is really a building, the Holy Sepulchre, that was built to embrace buildings that came to a site that was uh, identified as the site of the uh, resurrection of Christ. Uh, we see here the situation as it is now, but in, in the meantime, you may, you may have read this, or you have heard this, uh, the monument has been restored by Greek architects, and it's just open now again for the pilgrims, just before Easter, and here an uh, early, uh, uh, late, uh, late antique, uh, depiction of the kind of edicula that was standing on this holy site. And <coughs> it was here for everybody to, uh, who would not know this. Um, of course, interesting to know something about the logistics of these pilgrimages. How did they travel? What routes did they take? Uh, we know most things we don't know, simply we don't know. We know that there was a land route and we know that ships were important uh, means of transport, but the pilgrim of Bordeaux um, also crosses Italy and that's the reason that I show this map of his or her, we don't know what gender uh, she had. Uh, for the, the way to the Holy Land was a northern way to northern Italy and the way back was uh, by ship arriving in the south of Italy and then crossing the entire peninsula, Rome included, but nothing is told about Rome. So the intention was really to visit the Holy Land and all the other places are only mentioned, referred to, but not discussed in any detail of what was important there. Well, then we go to Rome itself, the pilgrim of Bordeaux, 333 doesn't say anything about what was interesting for pilgrims to see in Rome, but we know that there was something that was interesting already in that period. 
because Constantine had his building program and it had a lot to do with the topography of pilgrimage. Um, and there was something already before, um, mainly outside the walls. And many of you, of course, know these, this all, but I uh, repeat it here only in briefly um, because this, let's say, this uh, topography that existed already before Constantine of sacred places outside the city walls, cemeteries, but also cemeteries with important graves, and sometimes graves of, of people that were already considered as holy people and that were venerated. Um, this topography already existed in the early fourth century. So it is, a, let's say, a product of the growth of Christianity in the city of Rome in the third century. I don't go back earlier, but in the third century, uh, it, it was there. And you see this, this schematic map that it gives an indication of the um, yeah, relative abundance of sites that were already Christian um, sites in Rome before Constantine. It does not mean that the church was the owner of the sites, that's a quite different question. Probably most of them were private, but they had a Christian meaning and a Christian use. And we all know the catacombs and we all remember the, the romantic stories we heard about the catacombs being the places where the Christians gathered in secret because their religion was not tolerated in the Roman Empire and we all know since long that that's not true. But the catacombs are there and they were indeed used by Christians, but as funerary places. And in the catacombs are certain places that have already a kind of, let's say, emphasis, uh, monumentally or with paintings. And this is the normal kind of uh, catacomb corridor you see here. But here is a detail of a room that has certainly had a specific significance, maybe because it had an, uh, a, 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 yeah, an owner that was rich and uh, wanted to show something, but maybe also because of the, um, the function of the room as a site for the veneration of saints. In some cases, we can see that in other, we don't know it. Um, an important site, I, I would, uh, I, I dare to say, the most important site for uh, Christians before Constantine in Rome was the Via Appia, because there were really uh, there was a kind of cluster of catacombs that were used by Christians, and there was also a place, and that is the most yeah fascinating uh, story, uh, that was already a, a place of veneration of Peter and Paul in the third century. And we are very sure from this because we have documents and we have archaeological evidence that confirms um, each other. The site is indicated by the red arrow. Now there is the church of San Sebastiano. Some of you maybe have been there. But um, uh, Sebastian was only one of the martyrs that was buried in that catacomb. And later on he was the main saint on the site. But before Constantine, it was uh, another kind of veneration that took place here. We know exactly how it took place because it is well preserved under the floor of this 4th century basilica. And therefore, we are also sure it's 3rd century. You see here uh, the excavations to the left, uh, which in the depth of the, uh, you can see, uh, three mausolea that were no, not Christian mausolea, but were important uh, mausolea. And one of these... Um, buildings has a kind of Christian painting, so maybe that it was a Christianizing family. But more important is that uh, in the third century, this entire level was heightened, raised with six meters, and on that new level, a piazza was created, a kind of courtyard with galleries around it, and you see it there with the word memoria. Uh, so the uh, the, 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 the mausolea are here, but then underneath, six meters lower. And here is the courtyard with galleries. And I'll show you also a reconstruction of the courtyard itself. Here. So a kind of, of particle where people could sit 
the banks have been benches have been preserved, and the most important document is the fresco wall because it is full of graffiti, full of spontaneous uh, names and texts written by visitors, and it is absolutely clear that this site was used as a place of veneration for Peter and Paul. Yeah, why for Peter and Paul? We know that they were buried um, on other places in Rome, via Ostiense, the Vatican. Uh, we simply don't know. There are many hypotheses on this, uh, and it's not, I think it's not very interesting now to, to recall all these uh, different um, uh, arguments. But much more important is that it was a place of veneration for Peter and Paul, that Peter and Paul were considered already in the third century as, let's say, the founders of Christian Rome, like Romulus and Remus were the founders of pagan Rome, the Christians had Peter and Paul, and uh, in later texts this is also said explicitly, that Peter and Paul were seen as the apostles that had founded the Christian community congregation of Rome. And they were venerated here for some reason, uh, in a, yeah, an area that was predominantly in use already by Christians in the third century, that will have a lot to do with it, I think there have also been short periods of um, persecution in the mid uh, third century, so it may have to do with that. But the fact is, there are many graffiti, and they speak a clear language. It's all about intercession by Peter and Paul. Some of the graffiti refer to refrigeria, so funerary meals that were held there and that were Romans used to 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 hold on the tombs of their, uh, their, uh, their parents or their relatives, but also for venerated heroes like the saints. Uh, and some of the uh, inscriptions also uh, uh, make it clear that the visitors came from afar, that they arrived by boat, so probably from northern Africa, for instance, or from Illyria, and that, uh, or, or for instance, also one is recalling that the, the first is coming from Benevento in southern Italy. So they were what we should call pilgrims that came to that side. And here, one example of a graffiti that is uh, very, in, yeah, I think, eloquent. Uh, Paul et Petre petite pro vittore. So, Peter and Paul first, Paul and Peter uh, are asked to pray for Victor. It's the typical, um, uh, typical expression of um, intercession. And I think here we have already the entire phenomenon of pilgrimage. The only thing we don't have is the object of it. Because in our perception, pilgrimage has an object. You see it here, it comes very clearly. And I will return on that during my lecture now because that is an important question. What is the object of, uh, of such a veneration? Or could it be that in the first period there was not a concrete object, but rather an abstract object of veneration? I don't exclude that. Then Constantine, I said already, the uh, building program of Constantine is very uh, clear in its intentions. Um, in the Holy Land, it is very clear that it is really to, let's say, to, to give emphasis to the sites of biblical events. In Rome, it is more heterogeneous, because he is also building uh, here, the Red Arrow, a big church in the, in the, in, within the walls, and there was no tomb, there was no Christian use of that site before. Uh, but it was a very big church, the Lateran Basilica, that obviously was intended as, let's say, the bishop's church for a cathedral, uh, one of the first, first commissions of uh, Constantine. But he did a lot more. Pietro Marcellino on a catacomb, Via Vaticana. Uh, this is San Sebastiano, the church on the site where the apostles were venerated. No trace of the veneration of the apostle remain in that basilica. And that indicates that the veneration had already transferred to other sites in Rome. And it was not maintained there. It became the church of Saint Sebastian, who was buried in the catacomb, and not of Peter and Paul. 
St. Peter's. That was the place where, under Constantine, Christians believed that, that Peter had been buried. Uh, San Lorenzo. Lawrence, very important Roman martyr. I, I would say the first one after Peter and Paul. Um, a Spanish deacon that's martyrized in Rome in the third century. Uh, and then inside the walls, a very interesting commission. A church in a palace complex, an imperial palace, so it was more or less a private place for Constantine, or maybe for his mother, Helena, from whom we know that she was Christianized already in an early uh, period. Um, and it was dedicated to the Holy Cross. The church is called Jerusalem. I will come back on that aspect of Rome at the end of my talk. But keep it in mind, the church was called Jerusalem already under Constantine. And of course, there was a link between Rome and Jerusalem, because Constantine was working as uh, a builder of churches in Rome as well as in Jerusalem. And then San Magiese, maybe after Constantine died, but uh, it was a commission of his family. We have documents about it. Another important Roman martyr, the typical woman, young woman, like Foi, and the young, the young woman who was pure Christian, uh, very much venerated. And then also Paul. We don't know exactly when the first church was built there, maybe only after Constantine's death, and it was not a big church. But there came another church later in the fourth century that was as big as St. Peter's, but I will come back to that. That was a topography of Constantine's building program. So it clearly indicates that many of these sites have to do with either the veneration of saints or with the, let's say, the attraction of people for a certain um, yeah, sacred object, maybe in Jerusalem, the church in Jerusalem, the Holy Cross. Uh, but let me first talk, uh, take one example, uh, Saint Santa Agnese, I, I, I said already, it, it is a typical early uh, popular early martyr because she was young, because she was a woman, because she was uh, so faithful in her Christian uh, confession that she died at a young age, uh, probably only under Diocletian. That means that there was still an historical memory of this lady in the time that this church was built, only one generation or two generations after her death. Um, at the Via uh, Nomentana, and you see there was a big catacomb there, not that big, there are many others that are much bigger, but there was a catacomb there, and her grave obviously was in this catacomb, and there was built a big basilica outside of the catacomb ar area. It was not on the grave of the martyr, only at a later stage, a small church, smaller church was built here, E, but then we are already uh, in 680. So this is not, some, not Constantine. That was built on the grave. And, yeah, uh, the, an imperial mausoleum linked to the basilica. That confirms the importance of such a kind of commission for the imperial family. I mean, an imperial mausoleum really has a, a, a big meaning in antiquity. And then it was connected to a Christian church we have already one example at, um, at uh, Marcellino e Pietro, a little bit earlier. But this is very, uh, let's say, very suggestive. And it was intended for a daughter of Constantine, uh, Constantine. And in San Agnese, uh, we have a very interesting uh, testimony of the development of the martyr's guild in the fourth century. Because we should not forget that in Constantine's time, this martyr guild was not, let's say, um, a very <coughs> widespread phenomenon in Rome. It was very much um, focused on Peter and Paul, and under Constantine, primarily on Peter. And there were some other martyrs that were important, like Lawrence and like uh, Agnese. But it was not a widespread thing, and it was not essential, I would say, for the kind of architecture that developed here, with one exception, and that is St. Peter's, therefore I will come back on it. But San Agnese, you saw, it was not on her grave. It was close to the catacomb, but it was not on her grave. So this is a development in different stages. And a second stage after Constantine that is very important. We have a beautiful testimony here, because this is one of the best preserved uh, inscriptions by Pope Damasus, 
did I already give his name here and his years that he was Bishop of Rome? So in the second half of the uh, th uh, 4th century, he is the man who is a kind of impresario, I would say, of the martyr's cult in Rome. He tries to, um, to uh, monumentalize the martyr's graves themselves, what Constantine didn't do, with one exception, that of Peter. But for the rest, all the martyr's graves were hidden in the catacombs, in dark rooms, and maybe even uh, inaccessible for, for pilgrims and visitors. But Damas has started to monumentalize them, to make more space around them, to make kind of underground chapels, to create these beautiful inscriptions written by a friend of him, Philocalus, who was an epigraph and who designed these inscriptions. It's really uh, a very interesting typographical design, which you see with very characteristic lettering also. And beautiful poetical text. Many classical philologists say that Damascus was a bad poet, but for Christians he was very a good, really a good poet with uh, beautiful texts on the virtues of the martyr. And obviously intended for an audience. This was really um, made for an audience that was visiting the site. And that is also indicated the indicating the development of pilgrimage in the catacombs of Rome. And in uh, St. Agnese, we have also a very early uh, um, image of her on this marble slab that maybe was once part of the, uh, of the, uh, the, um, the, um, the appointments of her grave in the catacomb uh, that were beautified by, by Damasus. So the uh, a young lady as Orante. And here, one of the uh, gold glasses that were also very popular in later 4th century Rome uh, under Christians, and that were um, frequently reused in the catacombs to mark a certain grave of a relative with this glass. It is actually, it is, it is the bottom of a drinking glass. Uh, the text Zezes, which you can read, is something like, uh, um, drink it and be happy. Uh, it is really something that has to do with, uh, with, uh, with drinking. But the bottoms then were taken off and put into the martyr of, uh, of the uh, locally in catacombs. And they were all found in catacombs. All the gold glasses we have and of which we know that. This is one of them. And it's interesting that Agnes is one of the most, yeah, Peter and Paul are very frequently depicted on these uh, glasses. But then the first, um, I would say, behind Peter and Paul is Agnes. And this is one of the most beautiful Peter and Paul glasses we have, where both apostles meet each other, which is, I think, important for the significance that <coughs> Rome attributed to the apostles, namely the fact that they met each other in Rome, which is, as you may know, not in the Acts of the Apostle. It's not in the New Testament. There is not even any, um, any reference to a stay of, of Peter in Rome in the Bible. But for Rome, it was important that they had both been there and that they were in touch with each other, that they met each other as brothers in Christ, and that is depicted here. And now we come on the most, I, I would say, the most pronounced um, emphasis in the building program of Constantine. And that was the building of the biggest church in his program um, that built on the site of the, yeah, I would say the, um, the, the place where Christians thought that Peter had been buried. And that is St. Peter's. We see here uh, three churches. The first one is the Lateran Basilica on scale. So you can compare there also in scale. Lateran Basilica, the, the Cathedral of Rome, a big church, 100 meters long. Then St. Peter's, the second one, which is clearly the biggest. And then St. Paul's in the second stage, that is the late 4th century church that, had, that was built on the grave of Paul as a kind of response to the Constantinian Basilica of St. Peter's. Because Peter and Paul, obviously, in Roman theology, and you find it already under Damasus, had to be more or less twins. Equal brothers that had been both the founders of Christian Rome. So they both needed the same kind of basilica 
and the same size of basilica. <coughs> this was St. Paul's in the 18th century. Very suggestive painting that gives you an indication of the beauty and of the, yeah, the overwhelming spatiality, I would say, if that is a good English word, of, uh, of this church. Enormous five um, aisled basilica, still standing in its 19th century uh, um, variant, and still very impressive, but here in its original late 4th century architecture uh, and also decoration, focused on the tomb of St. Paul that was under the high altar. But I will not discuss St. Paul anymore now because I want to concentrate a little bit. I have to concentrate a little bit. This is only to show you what kind of basilicas these two were, Peter and Paul. Peter was the model for this one, clearly. It was a little bit different in some aspects, but it was clearly the, the, the model for St. Paul's. Um, and it gives you an indication of the enormous um, yeah, pretension of these uh, late antique imperial commissions in the Christian Empire. This is St. Peter's. Built on a ne necropolis, you see the necropolis underneath the floor, as far as it had been, has been excavated, it's only part of it. It was, of course, a pa pagan necrop necropolis, already uh, origi originating in the first and second centuries. Um, and you see that Constantine built his church on this necropolis, uh, with a certain intention, of course, that is quite clear, otherwise an, an emperor would not build a church Christian cult building on a pagan ne necropolis of families that were still living in Rome and still were visiting these mausolea. Peter would have been in Rome according to legend, not according to the Bible, according to Roman legend that was recognized in the second century by all Christian churches, but only in the second century. Some people say that's very late, I say that's very early. And Peter died in the 60s of the first century. Um, when you have a tradition that is one century later, it is relatively early, I would say, uh, from the point of view of cultural history. Maybe not from a theological or an exegetical point of view. But uh, from the, the, yeah, the perspective of cultural history, I think it's early. Well, the situation on the site uh, is there on the... On the, on the um, on the map, you see the uh, ancient circus, so-called circus of Nero. According to legend, Peter would have been, uh, would have been uh, martyred there, being crucified, and then with his head underneath. Uh, that is also in the early legends of it. And you see this medieval painting in the Sancta Sanctorum gives a clear indication also of the topography of the site, because it shows some important monuments that were standing in the Vatican area in late antiquity. So it was really located there, where the yellow circus was. And then, um, where the circus was in the first and second centuries, the necropolis developed, that is here in green, then the Constantinian Basilica in red, and the modern Renaissance Baroque Basilica in blue. So a huge continui continuity of sight. But this must have a situation a little bit when Constantine started his project. Uh, this is the, uh, let's say, a part of the necropolis looking in the direction of the north where the Vatican Hill goes up. And we see here, yeah, some, some uh, uh, mausolea. And behind those mausolea you see a square, a little courtyard on a higher le level with a can indicate it this way with this little monument, tiny little monument that was not even visible for the pagan families that were strolling through the main street of the, uh, of the necropolis visiting this beautiful mausolea, but it was there. And it was this tiny thing that Constantine chose as the focus of this enormous building, um, his biggest Christian church. This is the, rest, the reconstruction of the, uh, of the excavators in uh, the 40s of the uh, last century. 
Campo P is the name of this the excavators gave to this little courtyard. And you see on the western side is a kind of wall where this tiny monument is, um, yeah, is, is part of. Um, the complicated thing, some of you may have been there and may also have visited the excavations, and then it depends a little bit on the guide you have, uh, what story he or she is telling. Uh, sometimes it's very, very, let's say, scholarly, objective story. Sometimes it's a very um, yeah, uh, devotional, pious story. Both, of course, are interesting and important. Um, but um, when you have this sci more scientific tour, you will hear that underneath this tiny monument, there has not been found any grave. Not been found any um, body or part of a body that was really in a direct connection to this monument. But fortunately, there was found another uh, small yeah, loculus, uh, is it called by the, um, by the excavators? You may see that this monument is rather, it, it was a yeah, very, very uh, simple thing, but it was, became more complicated when on this side of the monument, in the third century, a kind of supporting wall was built. Then it became asymmetrical. And in this wall was, and now you see it here, the reconstruction, you see the wall was built there, the tiny wall, this one, Muroji. In Muroji, there is a, yeah, a, a loculus, an opening. It was covered with a marble slab, but it was really a, 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 a cave in it. And in this cave was found some dust, but also some dust that may be part of bones. And the bones were, of course, examinated, and it was established that it was a man coming from Palestine, uh, about 60 years old, died in the first century. Then you would think, when this was Peter, this wall will, will be full of graffiti that recall Peter. It is full of graffiti, so obviously it was visited before uh, Constantine, but no indication of Peter. I mean, what you see in the same period in the, on the Via Appia, Peter and Paul everywhere in every text, almost no indication here. This is the graffiti wall. Muroji, and this is the only graffito that has been important for one kind of argument, uh, a graffito that would read Petros Eni. So I have searched Peter here, but it's very dubi dubious, as you may see, if this re was really the text there. But it, and then it would be the only one. So it is surprising that Constantine chose this site to build this huge basilica. But as a cultural historian, and we are cultural historians, we can simply say this confirms that there was a tradition of the veneration of Peter. Even if it was not his grave, there was a tradition on this site that was so important that Constantine built here a unique building that was focused on this tiny monument. And that is unique because it never happened in, in the other uh, buildings of Constantine in Rome. Uh, in contrast to Palestine, we have seen in the Holy Sepulchre, they have also a, 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 an existing monument that became the focus of a new Christian building. But in Rome, we have only one example, and that is St. Peter's. Have a look at this to see this, the present situation and the excavation of the necropolis. And you can see this continuity of site. Um, actually, here we have this tiny monument. It's still existing underneath the high altar of the 17th century, here, of Bernini. So it's a continuity, and this is the, the other remnants of the necropolis that have been discovered in the 40s of the last, of the last century. So a unique building, a monumental building, that can only be explained by the fact that it was a building meant for the veneration of Peter, and certainly not only intended for a Roman audience, uh, but also from, for an audience from afar, uh, seeing the, uh, in view of the, of the size of the basilica. And 
again here an impression, a reconstruction of course, of the disposition that Constantine realized uh, surrounding this tiny monument. The monument itself is this one, but it is now encased in a kind of marble chest, you could say. So Constantine built this marble uh, yeah, edicula, two and a half meters high, but in it is the monument exactly how it was at this Campo, B, Campo P before. And then the reconstruction to, the, to your right of the, um, of the, the Baldacchino that had been built. How do we know this? Well, there were very important indications, architectural, yeah, thank you. There were very, <coughs> here, uh, the excavators found the basis of, let's say, the imprints of the basis of the columns. So it's quite a convincing reconstruction. But we have something else which I will show you now which you may even know because it's famous as well, the so-called Pola casket. Um, a, an ivory, tiny ivory box, um, one of the early reliquaries probably we have, even if it's not certain if it was a reliquary originally. I think it was, but not everybody's convinced. It was a reliquary uh, in a later stage, because it was discovered in 1905, I think, in uh, Samaga, that is in, in Croatia, in Istria, near Pola, under the altar of an early Christian basilica. So it was already used as an, a reliquary in that church. And, uh, well, I think it was also made as a reliquary, but we, we could discuss that. Um, this is a famous uh, thing for different, for various reasons. Uh, one reason, of course, is uh, the tradition of reliquaries, uh, of which we have heard since here this morning. Uh, the other reason is that it's, it's a visual document of the, uh, the tomb of Peter. Uh, but first I will show you some details of it. The lid is very much damaged, but it is clear what it shows. It shows the so-called traditio legis, which is not an original term, but it's, it is uh, used by art historians to indicate a certain iconography of Christ with Peter and Paul and Peter receiving the law of Christ, very popular in the second half of the fourth century and a little bit in the fifth and then basta. It doesn't appear again. Um, so it was popular in a certain period and it confirms, of course, the importance of Peter and Paul for Rome. Typical Roman uh, iconography. It was on the lid. And then we have, yeah, and, and the, the, the sarcophagus, of course, is to show you, yeah, to, to another example of this kind of uh, traditio legis, dominus legendat, is the original term. This is the front of the casket. Very interestingly, there is a lot of architecture depicted on it, even if it's tiny. And you see, the, the, it, is, it is not even 20 centimeters, so it's tiny, but it has a lot of architectural details on it. And therefore, I think it's very intriguing. Here, but here we have a, an iconographical depiction of the so-called Heti Masia, uh, Hetoi Masia, excuse me, uh, with a lamb standing on an em above an empty chair and the apostles uh, venerating it. It's an apocalyptical uh, theme, subject of the book of Revelation. But I will not discuss it in depth. This is also very intriguing part of it, the right side, which shows maybe a, a, a polygonal uh, architecture of, of uh, uh, columns and an architrave and, <coughs> and people going to something. Um, there's a lot of discussion on this uh, thing. I don't have a good picture of the left side, I'm sorry, that's also a very interesting thing, but maybe it's better that I don't have it because otherwise I would talk too much on it because this is the most important thing for us now. Um, and, they, and you may see that it, that it depicts something that the, uh, rec that the archaeologists that did the excavations uh, in the last century envisaged as the, um, the disposition surrounding the tomb of Peter. Um, very characteristic and I think decisive for the connection between this image and the archaeological site is 
are the six vine scroll columns, the twisted, tip, very typical twisted columns that you see on the uh, image and the carving. Vine scroll columns that have a tradition in St. Peter that is well documented, they are still there, but they are also mentioned already in the foundation um, story of Constantine in the Liber Pontificale. And it says that, it, that the emperor uh, brings vine scroll columns from Greece to Rome in order to be set up surrounding the uh, tomb of St. Peter. So we have a very direct document in it. And the, the columns themselves are still there. I will show that. But first of all, let us also look at the, uh, at the scene. It is quite clearly a scene of veneration of a monument standing underneath a baldacchino. A monument consisting of a kind of edicula, chest-like um, uh, structure with closed doors, as you may see. Is that clear? Closed doors and with a... <coughs> yeah, it's... I, I, will, I will show you a detail moment. This is better. Yeah. It's, it's, it's clear here, I think. Closed doors. And a kind of, yeah, um, um, arco. Arch, which is, uh, which is a kind of coronation of this door with a cross in it. And an... Obviously, a couple, a man and a woman, venerating this structure. And other people um, in their company under the columns. The most um, plausible explanation is that it is a scene of veneration by a couple from Istria that came to Rome, to the uh, Basilica of St. Peter's, to venerate the tomb of Peter. There's also a child on the, um, on, on the, um, in, in the company. Maybe they uh, dedicated their child to St. Peter's. Maybe it was even baptized in Rome, and that might have been the other image with the polygonal, polygonal building. But that is very hypothetical, of course. But I think the plausible explanation is indeed that this was a kind of memorial souvenir of a pilgrimage from people from Istria, Istria to St. Peter's. If you have an alternative, I'm really glad to hear that, but uh, I think this is uh, a very plausible uh, kind of arguing. And you see how, of course, the excavators have also used this as a source for their reconstruction. But on the other hand, there were many archaeological indications for the same reconstruction. And that brings this, this, um, this scene very close to a very specific site and a unique site, as I will repeat endlessly. Well, this is the, um, uh, the other thing that I told you, the, the history of the vine scroll columns that can be followed until the present day in St. Peter's. Uh, you, might, you may find them back in the pillars that Bramante built for under the cupola of new St. Peter's. And these pillars then were decorated by Bernini in the 17th <coughs> century, and he used these vine scroll columns uh, that were already spolia under Constantine. Constantine brought them from Greece, and they are older than Constantine. They are second century, maybe early third century, the archaeologists think. Uh, again, as spolia, but now in new St. Peter's, as a kind of memory to old St. Peter's and to the old disposition of the tomb. And Bernini put them, oh, I'm sorry, <coughs> Bernini put them here. This is the so-called Veronica pillar, and I will come back on that at the, at the end of my talk. But the vine scroll columns are clearly uh, recognizable as the same ones that are depicted here. And the same ones that are really mentioned in the Liber Pontificale. That is quite an extraordinary combination of, of material you have, of sources. Archaeological, documentary, and uh, iconographical. What do we know of the, uh, of the, let's say, the use of this memoria petri? That is uh, a term that Aug Augustine uses when he talks about St. Peter's in Rome. It is the memoria petri. 
So one century after Constantine had built it, um, Augustine talks in a very uh, spontaneous way of this is the memoria of Peter. That was a term used for it. Uh, of course, we have seen how it was used by this couple from Istria, but we have also some other sources. Uh, and I take some examples. Uh, John Chrysostom, who was the patriarch of Constantinople and who lived in the East and never came to Rome. He always says, I want to come to Rome, but I want to venerate the places of the, uh, where the apostles have been buried, but he never managed to do that. But he says, high officials of our Roman Empire come to Rome and then this typical Christian kind of, I would say, um, turning around, high officials come to Rome to bow for the graves of a fisherman, the lowest level you can, social level you can imagine, uh, from Galilee, and a maker of tents. And that's Paul, and Peter is the fisherman, of course. And the Emperor Honorius, we know that he came to Rome in uh, 403, 4, and the first thing he did was not going to the Palatine, where the emperor would feel at home, even if Honorius never lived in Rome, but the emperor, of course, belonged to go to the Palatine, and when he had lived a century earlier, he would have gone to the Capitoline Hill to uh, venerate uh, Jupiter there. But what did Honorius? The first thing he did was not greeting the prefect of Rome. Uh, no, he went to St. Peter's, and laid down his crown in front of the grave of a fisherman. The same kind of turning around. Did people see something of Peter there? Was there a visual representation of Peter that could, that could maybe uh, confirm or underpin this? experience, this physical experience and spiritual experience of being at that site? Well, maybe there was in the later 4th century in the apse, but it was certainly not an iconography with Peter in the center because that was very unusual, if not impossible, also theologically in, uh, in this early Christian stage. It came later, of course, it came in the, in the, in the uh, 6th and in the 7th centuries, uh, but the center of an, an apps program is always Christ himself. He is the real, the raison d'etre of each church building, the raison d'etre of the liturgy, and also the raison d'etre of the veneration of martyrs. Because the martyrs were nothing else as, let's say, followers, the best followers of Christ, even in death. So the central figure will have been Christ, and maybe it was more or less this, uh, iconography. It's also a traditional uh, traditio legis, um, and we have only few monumental examples in Santa Costanza, the mausoleum uh, close to Santa Agnese. We have this very badly restored uh, traditio legis. Look at Peter, how ugly he, he looks, um, of the fourth century. But it's an important document, of course, of this iconography that it also was uh, used in apses, and it was. I would say the most appropriate kind of decoration of the uh, apse of St. Peter's. We are not sure because the apse was uh, redecorated in the early 13th century in St. Peter's. And we know the iconography of that program also is Christ in the center, Peter and Paul on both sides, but not the traditional ladies. It was another kind of representation. Um, and here a reconstruction, but with Christ seated, whereas in the, in the regular, um, Patricio uh, Legis, Christ is standing. I think Peter will have looked originally more like this. This is the Peter of Santi Cosma Damiano. And, well, the, you know that it's one of the best preserved early Christian um, uh, mosaics we have in Rome. A very classical, even if it's 6th century, but it, it is still in the class, in late antique tradition uh, that might recall the apse mosaic of St. Peter. Therefore, I show you this face that is a little bit more convincing than the, <coughs> than the one in the restored mosaic in Santa Costanza. Well, let me now <coughs> survey uh, some sources about the acts of veneration taking place um, at the uh, tomb of St. Peter's. 
we hear that, um, that uh, visitors, when they come to the martyrs' graves in Rome, Prudentius is writing around 400 AD. Uh, he writes about various martyrs of Rome. This is uh, a, a, a source on Saint uh, Lorenzo, so on the grave of Lawrence. People come there on the feast day of Lawrence and they kiss the iron gratings that are surrounding the tomb and they are, of course, in tears. That is the typical, I would say, the topos of veneration that we find in the earlier, under the earlier Christian authors. But we hear some more details regarding the tomb of St. Peter's of Gregory of Tours. And then we are, of course, two centuries later, later sixth century, Gregory here from Gallia, um, a very important source on the early veneration of saints, as you may know. Uh, and he tells us that uh, a visitor to St. Peter's would insert his head in the opening, and he means the opening of this edicula, what is already called the confessio, this niche that was in the edicula, insert the head in the opening and doing a request of whatever is necessary in prayer of petition. So ask something to Peter and your prayer will uh, be heard. You can also, if you want to take a relic with you at home, you can also lower a piece of cloth into the tomb, and the excavators have found actually in the niche uh, an opening in the bottom, the bottom slab, a marble slab in the bottom of the niche, an opening, so you could lower something in that opening, where we know that no grave existed, but it was seen as the grave of Peter, of course. Um, lower a piece of cloth into the tomb and make it into a relic, as Gregory says. So a contact relic. Increase of weight is the result. So when you put the clothes in it, it weighs maybe 10 grams. And when you put it out, it's 20 grams. Uh, these kind of relics are called brandia or sanctuaria or pignora various terms we have. And then also what happens is Gregory telling us fashioning, the fashioning as a visitor, you can fashion gold keys. Well, that's not for every visitor, of course. Uh, you can fashion gold keys and then unlock the railings with that, symbolically, of course, but there are railings in front of it. And then uh, these keys will be blessed and they will have a miraculous power, for instance, to cure ill people. So various rites taking place there, probably not for each pilgrim, but for the whips coming there. But it gives us an indication. Another indication is this discovery found in the niche in the last century by the excavators, between two levels of the bottom of it. There were more slabs on the bottom. And between two levels, this was found. And this is clearly a very early example of an ex voto. <coughs> Uh, left by a pilgrim that asked, petitioned, to be cured by uh, maybe an illness in his eyes. And uh, well, these things, of course, have a very long tradition, but, uh, and even in antiquity they exist. But this is a very early example, I think, from a Christian context that we have. And the cross is cl quite clear <coughs> that it is Christian. The other tomb of the tombs of the martyrs, uh, we have now talked about the visit ad limina apostolorum, that will say the visit to the thresholds of the apostles. That is a term that was used already in the fifth century. And uh, it indicates the most important goal of pilgrimage in Rome. Uh, whereas there are many other goals as well. But don't forget, ad limina apostolorum until the present day is the main goal of pilgrimage, of course. Peter and Paul. I didn't discuss anything about Paul. Paul is also an interesting history. Also, we know a lot more about the disposition now, uh, thanks to uh, the excavator excavations that have taken place only very recently. So we know a lot more. It's very different from St. Peter's. Um, but I will not talk about it now. Even sh maybe a short break, five minutes, and then 20 minutes to finish. Yes. Is that OK? Yeah? I talk for an hour now, I think. Uh, so. Yeah?
Yeah, so um, we've talked now about the pilgrimage to the apostles' graves, Paul included, not discussed, but included. Uh, but let us now have a little bit a more broader view of the city of pilgrimage in late antiquity and also in the early Middle Ages. I want to go a little bit further now in the last part of my uh, talk in time. Uh, first of all, of course, the most important thing in Rome uh, for pilgrimage were the tom tombs of the martyrs, uh, and there were many of them. Rome was really proud of the number also of the tombs of the martyrs. Uh, and also of the quality, of course. It was quality and it was quantity. And you may remember that Ambrose was very jealous of Rome, that there were so many martyrs there and so few in Milan. So that was still true uh, for every pilgrim in the Middle Ages. But then there was also another thing that would certainly uh, belong to what pilgrims experienced in Rome, and that was the fact that it was the capital of the ancient Roman Empire with many monuments still standing. On this map you see the big monuments of imperial times indicated in um, the, this rosa color here, the Circo Massimo, for instance, the Colosseum, whereas the churches are in red and in uh, black. Uh, so it was a combination of imperial Roman monuments, still very impressive, um, and many Christian churches of different uh, sizes and of different grades of monument uh, uh, monumentality. And then there was an other aspect that was increasingly important, and that were relics. And with relics, I now intend to say something that is not the, the body of the martyr in its original grave, but it is something that was transferred from elsewhere part of the body of, an, of, a, of a martyr, or even another object like the chains of St. Peter's that were venerated already in a church in the center of Rome, San Pietro in Vincoli, um, so Peter in chains, um, in the fifth century. So it's an old uh, example of a non-corporal uh, relic in Rome. What are the typical developments in the early Middle Ages of this uh, pilgrimage uh, tradition? It is first of all the integration of pilgrimage, I would say, into the liturgy of Rome. Um, the liturgy that was typical, the stational liturgy, where the Pope celebrated on certain days of the year in different churches of the, of the city. Most of them city uh, churches with important martyrs' graves or with important relics. So liturgy and um, pilgrimage um, focused on relics and graves were, let's say, integrated increasingly in the early Middle Ages. I cannot discuss this in detail, of course, but I only shown you a map of Rome um, in the uh, 11th century, that's a little bit later, but that we have a good source from that period. In blue are the churches where the Pope, at least once a year, but sometimes, much more frequently, for instance, St. Peter's, it is more than 15 times a year. Um, but the blue churches are where the Pope celebrated at least once a year. And the red churches are churches where a procession started, a kind of penitential procession, preceding the stational celebration during Lent. So the period before Easter, where we, we, are, we are in now, <coughs> the period when many Pilgrims came to Rome also for penitential reasons, uh, and later also, of course, to earn indulgences. But that is a high medieval development, of which I'm not talking now. But these penitential processions started, started in the red churches, and they went to the blue churches. So it was really a network of processions that was characterizing the city, in which liturgy, papal liturgy, and pilgrimage, and veneration of the, of the saints were integrated in a very special and typical Roman way. Typical Roman because in each procession you also was, were passing ancient monuments, sometimes with Christian stories in it, like the Colosseum, the stories of the persecutions. So you can imagine what it, what it meant for a visitor to Rome to experience this scenery. 
Then the second point that is very uh, characteristic for the early Middle Ages is the increase of sacred destinations inside the walls. Because until now, <coughs> the original saint tombs were all outside the walls. Constantine built most of his churches outside the walls. Also later, martyr churches were outside the walls. And now in the early Middle Ages, we see that many churches inside the walls also become point, uh, sites of veneration of saints, um, particularly of, say, of Roman saints whose bodies or parts of bodies were translated from the original tombs outside the city to the city churches. And that is a phenomenon that starts um, in the 8th century and then is very important for the centuries after that. And not only for Rome, because many of these relics were also uh, transported to, for instance, the, the Frankish Empire and came here in Gallia or in Germany, um, but also in Rome. So these churches inside the city that were built originally only for pastoral le reasons, the so-called titular churches, were now also churches that were interesting for pilgrims to come to. Maybe in late antiquity it was only Jerusalem, the so-called Jerusalem church, Santa Croce, that had this function. But then in the early Middle Ages, many other churches got it. San Pietro in Vincoli, already in the fifth century with the chains, but then also with corporal relics. So relic translations are very characteristic. And then the increase of non corporal relics. We had already the chains of Peter. We have also chains of Paul. And when you have been in St. Paul's uh, in recent years, you may have seen the chains that are now really exhibited uh, in the Confessio of New St. Paul's, but that were already there in the 5th century because John Chrysostom is talking about these chains. Non-corporal relics become more important in the early Middle Ages and, um, well, the most famous site for it is here in the Lateran Palace um, where this chapel here was called Sancta Sanctorum since the 8th century because it was actually a holy of holies for the um, uh, preservation, conservation of precious relics, many of them from the Holy Land. So it was also a kind of, you can say, translation of the significance of the sites in the Holy Land to Rome. Relics of Christ himself, but also relics, geographical relics of places in the Holy Land like we have maybe also here in Kong. This is a good example of such a geographical collection of relics. This box has stones from biblical sites in the Holy Land. It's, uh, it's from the seventh century with nice scenes of the uh, life of Jesus on its lid. And this is the, uh, the, the front of the chest in which these relics were uh, preserved. Many centuries, this is about 800 AD, and the relics were only taken out when they were discovered around uh, 1900 AD, so one century ago. And, well, this is another story I will not talk about it. Maybe you know something of it, of this so-called treasury of Sancta Sanctorum, but it's a very important treasury of reliquaries. I don't know, Cynthia, it's more important than this one, but it's... A little bit earlier, it is a little bit earlier. That, that, is, that is, I think, very uh, important uh, for the tradition of these treasuries of, of relic, reliquaries. It is early medieval. But let us go back to the Apostle Churches itself, because the last very important uh, development is that the tomb of a saint, either the original tomb or the artificial new tomb where the relics were translated to, were now integrated into the altar of a church. That was something that did not exist in early Christianity. It happened in St. Peter's, therefore I show again, I come back on St. Peter's here, we have here the Constantinian um, disposition with the edicula, which was not an altar, it was, it was, it was a, a niche with a, a marble chest, uh, incorporating it, but the altar must have been somewhere in front. It was a movable altar here or even, even here. And then 
around 600 AD, the situation is very much um, remodeled. The upper part of the edicola becomes the altar. <coughs> it is the physical altar of the medieval Basilica of St. Piet since 600 AD, uh, thanks to the fact that the floor was raised here. So then you could use this upper, let's say, uh, uh, 100 centimeters, the upper part of the edicola as the altar block. And the Pope was celebrating in the Middle Ages until the demolition um, in the later 16th century here. But the veneration of the tomb of Peter could simply continue by going to the front of the, uh, of the presbytery because there still was here the, opening, the same opening that we have here in the edicola. Nothing changed there. The niche is still there. It is still there. But now on a lower level, you can see it in this so-called open confessio moderno. And there was another possibility for pilgrims to approach the tomb of Peter. And that was going underneath this raised floor and go into this new ring crypt that was created here. And then approach to the rear of the original Constantinian edicola that was in this central corridor of the, of the crypt. So it was really a very interesting design that was developed specifically for the situation in St. Pete because it is clear what happened here. Nothing could be changed in the physical um, structure of the Constantinian monument. It was untouchable, but everything could be changed in the context of it in order to make it liturgical more practicable. That is the intention of this, uh, of this um, um, campaign here. And it was typical for St. Peter's, but then it becomes the model for many other churches inside Rome, but also outside, that have relics in their altars. Not an original tomb, like Santa Prasede. It's a titular church. It doesn't have an original tomb. It is in the center of the old city. But it got many relics by Pope Paschal I in the ninth century from the catacombs put into a nice sarcophagi underneath the altar, and the, and the altar was built in a situation that was imitating that of St. Peter's. You see it with a ring crypt here, a rectangular corridor in the center, and a niche in front of it. There were also other variants in other churches, but this is the most specific kind of imitation of the situation of St. Peter's. It also confirms, of course, how important St. Peter's was and how successful it was in combining being a place of the highest liturgy, namely the most frequent place of papal station on liturgy, and the veneration of the sacred tomb of the apostle, so a goal for pilgrims. This combination was highly successful there, and it was imitated. And you still see it now in Santa Prasede. It, 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 this is the 18th century um, uh, variant of it, but the, the disposition is still the same. We have the niche here underneath the altar. Here. And when you enter here, you can see the sarcophagi with the relics and the altar here above and uh, a raised floor for the presbytery behind it. And then the last aspect of development in the f uh, early Middle Ages that is very characteristic is, I would say, the professionalization of pilgrimage in Rome, the higher level of organization of it. And we have several aspects that uh, attest to this development. The first aspect are the texts that were made specifically for pilgrims when they visit Rome, or for pilgrims that cannot visit Rome and are monk in a Frankish monastery, have no money to come to Rome. But reading these texts, they are virtually in Rome because they are guided to all the important sites of devotion, piety, veneration, and papal liturgy in these texts. We have the, f the earlier one are uh, 7th century, then we have 9th century, 8th and 9th century pilgrims guides. Um, this is taken, um, this photograph is taken from the catalog of an exhibition that started last week in Paderborn in Germany, an exhibition on Rome, the city of Rome, as it is perceived from the north of Europe. Um, and it has a lot to do with pilgrimage because, uh, yeah, the perception of Rome is for a part, of course, the perception of pilgrims, travelers to Rome in the Middle Ages. And then after 
the Middle Ages there also are also cultural visitors and uh, grand tour visitors and then tourists, of course, it's all there, but it has this same tradition uh, of pilgrimage to Rome. Uh, that is the, 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 the subject of that exhibition and there are many interesting objects that have to do with our uh, topic. This is one of them, an original manuscript of the Notitia Urbis Romae that describes the uh, most important sites for pilgrims in the second person. So it, it, it tells you, now you go to the right and you take the street there and then you come to St. Paul's and there you kneel bef in front of, the, of, his, uh, of his tomb and then you go to the catacomb over there. Don't forget to take that bridge. So it really, it is a very direct kind of language that is completely unusual in antiquity for such kind of, hey, you know, there also exist guides in, in antiquity, but it, this second person is very typical for Christian texts. And you encounter it also in inscriptions in churches that tell you, you who are looking to this place, you will see typical Christian. Pilgrim's Guides, well, here we have uh, uh, important destinations that are mentioned in the Pilgrim's Guides, uh, guides outside the walls. The interesting thing is that many churches inside the city walls had already relics, but the pilgrims still went to the catacombs. They did not do so in the later Middle Ages. The catacombs were more or less forgotten then. But in the 8th century, they still go to the catacombs, and we have also graffiti of pilgrims from England, for instance, and from Northern Europe with very strange uh, German or Teutonic, like my name, my first name, in there. So it's clear that they come from afar and they visited the catacombs still in the uh, 7th, 8th, 9th century. And after that, as I said, it stops. There are so many relics then in Roman churches inside the city and many relics of Roman saints in, in, in Europe that the catacombs were forgotten. But still here, they are there. And you see that on that, this schematic map. And then another um, uh, famous guide the, in, in the manuscript of Einsiedel. Uh, it is famous because it combines the Christian sites with antique monuments, with ancient Roman monuments. For instance, on this side, this is also the one that is exhibited in Paderborn now. You see that it is um, talking on the Rotunda, I think. Rotunda, that is the Pantheon. It was a church indeed, but there are also other pagan monuments that are indicated in this guide. And we have here a schematic reconstruction of all the routes that this guide describes. Twelve different routes passing important Christian sites, but also important ancient Roman monuments. Another aspect of this professionalization of pilgrimage is the uh, foundation of uh, guest houses for pilgrims to welcome them. And well, I don't discuss this in detail, but uh, the, older, uh, uh, the older institutions are the so-called xenidogia, so the guest houses for strangers, uh, literally. Uh, we have also diaconiae in Rome, so churches that were linked to a, um, uh, let's say, a welfare station, a Christian church-guided welfare station, not only for the poor people living in Rome itself, but also for pilgrims. And then in the 8th century, the typical national institutions, that is interesting because then Europe is obviously, um, um, uh, um, let's say, developing in the sense of national unities. So we have a scola, that is the name for this kind of institution, where pilgrims could be housed, they could also stay there if they, uh, were, they fell ill, for instance, or if they died in Rome, they could be buried there among their own fellow, uh, fellows from the same nation. So we have uh, a scola of the uh, Langobards here. We have a scola of the Franks here. This is St. Peter's. So most scolae were there, close to St. Peter's, because almost all pilgrims from the north went to St. Peter's first. Here, the Anglo-Saxons still there, Santa, the, the church is still there, Santa Maria in Sassia. And I, as a Frisian, I'm very proud that our people was important enough here to have its Ola Scola Frisonorum, of which there is still some trace under the present church. The only Scola that is, that is uh, visible partially 
in archaeological um, uh, remnants. For the rest, we have only texts. But it's, it, it's interesting, I think, that then in the 8th century, these nations want to identify themselves as nations close to the tomb of Peter. Well, I will finish now only with some, let's say, perspectives uh, into the High Middle Ages to indicate some important changes that took place in the High Middle Ages, apart from the continuity of tradition, because that was the most important <coughs> thing. I mean, the ad limina apostolorum is until today the most important aspect of Roman pilgrimage, and it remains so uh, during all those centuries. But there are some interesting developments, I think, that I on indicate only briefly to give you this perspective in time. And the first is, uh, I come back here to the chapel of the Lateran Palace. It is now a 13th century chapel, but it is the successor of an older chapel. Let's say the, yeah, the papal chapel. It was the house chapel of the Pope, like the 16th chapel is now in the Vatican Palace. It's much smaller, but it has an enormous treasury of relics. I said it already. And the interesting thing is that one type of relic is actually a new type that is developing slowly in the early Middle Ages, but becomes very important in the high Middle Ages and afterwards. And that is, I would say, the visual relic. Uh, and then not only visual in the sense of a reliquary, but also visual in the sense that you see the saint itself in some way, namely in his or her image. So sacred images. This is the famous icon of the Sancta Sanctorum, early medieval. Hardly visible now because all of, of all the, the gold and silver um, that, is, that covers it, but the, the original icon you see to the left is an early medieval picture of Christ uh, painted on wood by nobody. It means it is not painted by a man. It is painted by the Holy Spirit in the sense that it is a direct portrait of Christ, a so-called achairo poieta in bad Greek, but that is the name that Romans used for it. So it was painted by its own power, let's say, the power of the image itself. And that is, I think, uh, very typical for uh, what develops into the High Middle Ages because we see that pilgrims are much more interested in these visual relics in the High Middle Ages. When you, when you take High Medieval pilgrim guides, you will find many churches that have images of saints and that pilgrims go to, to churches where images are that either are Achero Poietai or painted by St. Duke, for instance, uh, uh, the images of the Virgin painted by St. Duke. I cannot go into detail, but you know it, you probably know it. And one of the most famous examples, of course, is this one, uh, the Vera icon, that it means it is not an icon at all, it is the image of Christ as this was, it was printed on the uh, so-called uh, cloth of Veronica, the veal of Veronica. That was kept in St. Peter's from an unknown moment, but it is there in the 11th century, and then it becomes one of the most important relics of St. Peter's. When we hear from kings visiting the Pope in the High Middle Ages, they do not go to the grave of St. Peter to lay their crown there, like Honorius did in the early 5th century, but they were shown the Vera icon. It could be shown from an altar. You see the altar here on this, uh, um, this picture of the early seven, um, late 15th century. But when we had been not in Conque, but in Rome last Sunday, the fifth Sunday of Lent, we would exactly have seen this scene. Because that is an old stational, stational day in St. Peter's, the fifth Sunday of Lent, and all the important reliquaries are then exposed on the high altar, where the Pope does not celebrate on that day, even if it's a stational day originally, but the Pope doesn't come to St. Peter's on that day. So the whole high, high altar is used as a kind of uh, yeah, deposit for relics, reliquaries. And the most important relics are then exhibited from the balconies that Bernini created for them in the pillars. And um, yeah, when you, uh, has somebody once experienced this? It is not well known among visitors to Rome. Strange enough, I have lived in Rome for eight years, so I discovered it, that it was tradition on the fifth uh, Sunday of Lent, and it is really a moving uh, scene, because then two old, uh, very old canons come to the balcony, 
and they show the Vera icon of Veronica this way. This is the, the big statue of Bernini underneath the balcony. And then we have the balcony of Veronica, and you see again her veil with the image of Christ also depicted there in the sculpture, and like here. And everybody standing uh, uh, around the high altar, St. Peter is kneeling and is making crosses, and it's really a very moving scene. Well, this change in, let's say, in focus in uh, high medieval pilgrimage is also attested by these souvenirs that, that pilgrims took with them, brought with them to their homelands. Here, of course, Peter and Paul, the first one. Then, very interestingly, an icon of the Virgin seated with a kind of vault above it. It is the image of Mary painted by St. Luke that was kept in the Pantheon and still kept in the old Roman temple, Rotunda, that became a church. So pilgrims went there to venerate that image, that icon. And then the last one is, of course, the Vera icon. And it was the most popular um, souvenir that pilgrims bought in St. Peter's in the High Middle Ages. Not Peter and Paul, but the other one. And we know it because they have been found overall in Europe, everywhere. An enormous widespread phenomenon. A direct colleague of mine in, in Nijmegen is a specialist for these lead pilgrims' badges, and it is, it's amazing where, where, where you find these pilgrim badges from Rome. And another aspect, typical high medieval, but already in a sense there in Constantinian times, is the pretension of Rome that you don't need to go to other places. Why go to Jerusalem when Jerusalem is already in Rome? Why to go to Santiago when the most important apostles are in Rome? Because, of course, there was rivalry between the main goals of pilgrimage in the high Middle Ages. Jerusalem was uh, then uh, European in the sense it had Latin, uh, Latin kings, and you could visit Jerusalem easily in that period. Santiago, as you know, was very much developed in the high Middle Ages. But best of all, the best choice you could make is going to Rome because you have everything there. And Jerusalem was there, also in a very concrete sense, and not only with cross relics that are already under Constantine probably were the, were the focus of, of the church called Jerusalem, but also other things like the steps from the palace of Pontius Pilate in Jerusalem that were simply the main entrance of the Lateran Palace. They, they were actually, uh, what is it here? Here. It was a high, because the, the main level was the first floor of the Lateran Palace, so you had to to go up these steps. And in the course of the Middle Ages, these steps were interpreted as the steps from the palace of Pontius Pilate with the drops of the blood of, blood of Christ in the marble still visible. And you see these pilgrims that are going to uh, up the steps on their knees. And then towards the end of the period I want to discuss, we have the introduction of a so-called Jubilee year that then became an important focus of pilgrimage to Rome, first once in a century, then once in a half century, and then very fastly already uh, once every 25 years with some extra holy years while we had, uh, while we had last year. Uh, so, and this is a picture from a, northern, from a manuscript from Luca which shows the uh, medieval pilgrims as they looked like in their, in their uh, pilgrimage, pilgrims' uh, robes with their hats, with their staffs, uh, visiting Rome, Rome, and you see the city is existing in a combination of ancient and Christian monuments, these typical medieval bell towers, uh, but also the cupola of the Pantheon is obviously visible. That was where people went to and where they could earn very important and high indulgences. And we have now the Luther year, and you may know, remember why Luther started his protest against the church. It was exactly uh, in this tradition, and I end with this beautiful um, uh, map of medieval, late medieval Rome uh, in the uh, Palazzo Comunale in Siena, um, because it shows the real reason for pilgrims to go to Rome. It was not only because of the apostles, it was not only because of the Vera icon, it was not only because of Jerusalem that was in Rome, it was the city itself with its memory of these early Christians that was so visible and 
I would say, um, um, palpable in that city, that it was actually the city as a whole that was working as a relic. And when you came in that city, you would also find automatically the ancient monuments that gave another layer of experience to that same Christian city as this painter here shows us in this, uh, in this symbolic map of Rome in which ancient Roman and Christian monuments are combined. That's what I wanted to tell you, and um, if we have some time, but not much, I think, Ivan? Yeah? yeah? Otherwise, there will be other occasions, but if you have any questions or remarks or maybe uh, also uh, suggestions to me um, and to the others, I'm grateful for that, of course. You mean the books? The books? Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, it, it is clear, for instance, from the notizia, the, the, the first one I showed, that it is very clearly a guide for people who came to Rome. But they could not, of course, take this book under their arms. That would not have been possible. When you see it in Paderborn, it's something like this. It is a big manuscript. So it was copied by monks in Frankish uh, monasteries, maybe also here in Gallia. And um, it was copied as a text, as a kind of memory uh, to Rome for people who had been there, and as a kind of virtual trip to Rome uh, for people who could not go there. But the text itself has clearly been written for people who visited the city. It, maybe it was different for, for instance, the, 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 uh, the Einsiedel description, because that is not very practicable. Uh, even if we, I have shown some reconstructions of the roots, but uh, it is really doubtful if that was really a practical guide. So I think there were different types of texts, but there were certainly some that were also meant for a very practi practical use. But then, of course, you could not take them in the codex like this, and you had to have another version of it in your pocket, right? Mm -hmm. And were there, any, uh, mm -hmm. any, were there some visual components on the, those books? Like, I don't know, some maps, something like that? No. So you can contemplate no. it on... Uh, all the copies we have, all the copies we have, don't have any visual, let's say, uh, element. Um, and I think when the copies don't have it, also the original book uh, will not have had it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No. Then we discuss it the notion of maps with Anneli Kansky at the end of our yeah. okay. But uh, I would to add uh, something quite banal, but uh, it's important. I mean, they learned by heart. They had the memory which was much more used to learn by heart thing. I mean, if you see what it means to be an educated man of the 9th century, you can quote the life of St. Martin writing yourself without having the book of the life of St. Martin nearby. So if you have the possibility to just consult mm -hmm. such a guide, you will simply, I mean, in Rome, for example, learn by heart your question because the book is a rare object. The biggest library has decades of books. I mean, the, the massive use of the book or the painting. So if we imagine the activation of those information of by the memory. Yeah. And then if you have a good memory, you will just <laughs> learn it once. Better, worst one, you will maybe check it today. But in some sense, it's the trust. I would say nothing to ask. But if you know that, I mean, you read the, the pages, you have to go to St. Peter's, cross the bridge, near mm -hmm. St. Angelo, and so on, you just know it. And then you can ask. Believe it or not, but I, <laughs> I think Ivan I think is right. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Do, do, um, do you know when the relics that uh, uh, San Croce and Guru Salena came from? Well, it is already said in, in, the, in the foundation history of Constantine, which is an original, uh, I said it for St. Peter's, eh, on, on the columns, the Weinstock columns. These texts in the Liber Pontificalis, uh, in the Vita of Pope Sylvester, describe the foundation of the churches by Constantine. And you may say, well, the Liber Pontificalis, 6th century, that is all fantasy. No, it contains original archival material. 
And the donation list of Constantine of St. Peter's has this on the vine scroll columns from Greece. The donation list on the church called Jerusalem has um, a lamp, a lamp, brand, um, um, a lamp standing in front of the cross. So that is the entry that is in the donation list. It doesn't say the emperor donated the cross. No, it does say there is a lamp in front of the cross. Mm -hmm. So obviously that was the focus of the interior. And to me that is enough to, let's say, to, to, to postulate that, that already in, maybe not even in Constantine's li lifetime directly, but then under his sons that were still uh, in power after him and also have done something in Rome, uh, like his daughter Constantina who built San Agnese. But in the first half, let's say in, in the second quarter of the fourth century, that there was already a relic of the cross in Rome. And well, there is a little bit of discussion on this because the, the experts on the cross relics who know all the texts of not only of Eusebius, but also of Cyril of Jerusalem, which is one generation later, let's say the 60s of the fourth century. And he's the first one who really describes cross, cross relics and also the distribution of cross relics. Uh, there is a big discussion, of course, if Constantine could already brought a cross relic to Rome before this cross relic distribution started in Jerusalem in the sources. But the sources can, of course, also reflect a tradition that already exists since a couple of de decades, not longer, but 20, or f uh, 20, 20 years at least, yeah. And this is also a problem with the cross relic, if I remember well, there are two problems. <coughs> First is, uh, I think it's Guillaume who wrote about it. Mm -hmm. um, the, the second point of the fifth century, they discovered a relic of the true cross into the Lateran. In the, well, in the actual reliquary of the cross. Yeah, like sort of yeah. Thing. Well, in, in, in the in the in the fifth century, there was a, a foundation of chapels in the Lateran baptistry, uh, two uh, dedicated to Saint John. One is Saint John the Evangelist, the other is Saint John the Baptist. Both altars are said to have a confessio, and it means a niche where you could enter your where you could enter your head to venerate the relics like St. Peter, because the term confessio is typical for the original tomb of Peter it's in, in, in St. Peter's. But these altars had a confessio, that means a kind of cave inside of it and a kind of opening in front of it. But then there must have been something, otherwise it would not have been a confessio where you could venerate something. So probably non-corporal relics of John the Baptist and John the Evangelist. And the other chapel was actually dedicated to the Holy Cross. And there was also a confession in the altar. And logically, there must have been uh, a cross relic in that altar. But that is 470. So it is 130 years after Constantine. And that is quite a long time. So that is clear. I mean, there has been a cross relic in the Lateran already in the 5th century. And maybe it's one of the relics that came later to the Sancti Sanctorum. Yeah. And that is, makes sense. Uh, and then in the 5th century, there were already cross relics everywhere. Don't forget that. I mean, we have found an inscription in, in, in northern Africa, uh, uh, almost now in Morocco, I think, very much to the west, where it is said in, in, in the early 5th century that there was a cross relic in, the, in, in, in that church. So it was very much distributed already. Well, I have just another question. So it's, because you talked about this moved the altar into St. Peter's Basilica. Yes. Because the pastor was obviously not the place of yeah. the celebration. But you probably wrote it, I don't remember it, so may I put it up. But um, do you really think that the, the liturgical use of the, of the, of the St. Peter's was Eucharistic since the early beginning? Yeah. We yeah, no, it, was, it was a church, uh, and Constantine donates an altar. So in the donation list, mm -hmm. is said that Constantine donates an altar with many, many pounds of silver on it. So it means that it was a very precious uh, piece of furniture. But probably these early altars were, um, in principle, basically movable, wooden structures. And in this case, a wooden structure with a lot of silver. Uh, made on it to make it more precious and the I don't know, remember the weight exactly but it is too heavy 
to, uh, to uh, move it with two, with two powerful men, I would say. It's, very, it's, it's really a, a, an impressive kind of furniture, and it is in a donation list, so it's really original, the Eucharistic altar of St. Peter's. It is Altare. I, sh I forgot to mention, I really should have put it in the talk today, but Begon, in the time of Begon, there was a, a silver altar here. Uh -huh. Yeah. I mean, there's a scrap of it yeah. left in the treasury, so yeah. it's another reflection of the pretensions yeah. of, of Comte. Yeah, there is a certain tradition of silver altars, also yeah. in the Carolingian period, yeah. so that may link Constantine to uh, the altar that has been here, but that's maybe another discussion. But um, it, it, is, it is an interesting tradition, and we, as far as I know, we don't have any real silver altar left from the Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. But there are many sources that are talking about silver altars, also in later times, but I think it is a reception of Constantinian tradition. Mm -hmm. Because some churches in Rome really uh, have in their donation list of Constantine that they get an altar. And the most heavy one, the most pre precious one, was the one of St. Peter's. And I'm sorry, do you imagine it where? I mean, do you imagine it used? Or well, that is, of course, another discussion. St. Peter was a huge building. <laughs> and uh, probably but there was not a Eucharist every day. That was not usual in the, in the, in the, in the, uh, in the fourth century. Uh, so the altar may really have been um, positioned only in a, in a central place on some days when the Pope came to celebrate there. Um, but um, at a certain moment, it is quite sure that it had a fixed position. Because from the 5th century onwards, we have fixed altars everywhere, also stone altars. And then it would have been awkward to have a movable altar in, a, in, a, in, a, in an important basilica like St. Peter. So I think in the 5th century already, there was a kind of mm -hmm. fixed disposition of the altar, but maybe not a very happy disposition, because you had this conference between the Avicola that had been accessible for the pilgrims and the altar that became very important. And therefore, the solution found here in, in 600 was, of course, immensely successful. It actually identified altar and, 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 and tomb in one structure. It was a great creation, I think. <laughs> Ambrosian idea. <laughs> I, uh, I have one question remark, which is maybe a bit far-fetched, I think. But during our walk, we saw many places where, which were obviously conceived in Lopi, for example, for pilgrims to wait uh -huh. uh, before entering the, the Celtic space. And when you were showing the Memoria Apostolorum, mm -hmm. uh, I thought there is already this space where pilgrims could indeed wait with mm -hmm. the benches, and also where they had time to do the graffitis. Do you think it's even possible that there were images in those spaces? Or you mean already in the third century? Because yes, yeah. this, this very this oldest place of worship we know, of Christian worship we know around. Because yeah. there is a waiting space, so I don't know how... Well, it's a courtyard, actually, and, and, and there is a portico, and all the graf graffiti are in the portico, and there are benches. But I think there was a kind of, uh, of let's say, turns of, uh, of pilgrims coming there, because uh, when you have to sit and when you have to use a funeral meal, mm -hmm. uh, you have to organize it a little bit. It cannot be a very spontaneous thing, I think. And so people have to sit on their benches. I don't know how many capacity it has, maybe 30 or 40 pe uh, persons, but not more. And other people have to wait somewhere, that's clear. And there were certainly different turns of, of visitors coming there, using the refrigerium, and maybe writing something in the in the wall. So there was the component of waiting, which is good. That must have been, of course, but I think not in the place where the graffiti are, because the graffiti place is where the benches are. Mm -hmm. And the yeah. benches are where the people really use this refrigerium. It is, it, is, it is mentioned in the graffiti, so it was something that happened there. Mm. But in, 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 in a church building, of course, I mean, St. Peter's, I, I showed it with this immense atrium. That is a good example uh, of. of let's say, a, a place of gathering and waiting for pilgrims before they enter the church. And when it's bad weather, they can go under the, in, in the party coast to uh, protect themselves for the rain. And when it's good weather and it's summer in Rome, they to, to protect themselves for the sun. So it's very practical. And you saw in the direct instruction that I showed you that it was a really an immense uh, space. I mean, the atrium was as, as, as large as the entire nave of the basilica. But I think that was really a, a place of of waiting, of gathering, of meeting. Later in the Middle Ages, it was there that the veggies were sold. And that was the, the place where the, where the uh, 
and also a dentist was helping you when you had when you had <laughs> trouble in your mouth, and he could help you on the steps of St. Peter's. It's all in medieval descriptions of it. But many, many um, uh, merchants that were selling these these souvenirs. It was all in the atrium. But, uh, just because of St. Sebastian, I have this only has a doubt that what he discovered is actually not the, the entire. Because, of course, it's a place for a refugium, but normally the refugium is done in proximity to something. So we have the inscription Peter and Paul, mm. we have the place and, mm. and we don't have the reason why. So you, you, don't, you don't have the object. No. You don't have the object. No. And since well, one of the questions about objects which we have to touch is the goal of the pilgrimage mm. in basically each culture. On one hand, on the other hand, there is still this legend, uh, Constantinian, but existing, mm -hmm. that at a certain point, uh, the bodies of Peter and Paul were in San Sebastian, mm -hmm. because they were carried there, in order to be protected, and then, after the end of persecution, sent yeah. back yeah. to San Peter and Paul. Yeah. So, I, this, le this, let's say this legend, or this myth, is quite criticized. Yeah, because it's, it's absolutely a hypothesis. My, my, I, 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 I emphasize it. It's strange that you have this kind of veneration without any known object. But um, maybe early Christians were capable of doing things in a more abstract way because they were, of course, very much against the, let's say, the concrete kinds of cults that the pagans had, focused on objects like statues or, or other things. Um, and that changed, of, of course, that changed rather Fastly, I would say, after Constantine, but uh, it was Christian tradition not to have objects and to what you venerate is in your mind, is in your is in the spirit. And to me, it's not impossible that in the third century there was absolutely a place where some memory of the apostles was, but it could also have been a story. They have been here. They have met here. Damasus has made an inscription for that. The inscription itself, the tablet, is not preserved, but a text we know. And the text starts, hic habitasse, Peter and Paul. So Peter and Paul lived here. They dwelt here. But that does not mean that they were also, temporarily, maybe, or not, uh, buried there. It could also be that they had been there. And that there was some kind of memory that was important for the Christians. And it was a practical place for Christians to meet because this part of the Via Via was very Christian already in the third century. Mm -hmm. Whereas the other places where Peter and Paul were also in memory because we have a very old document on it saying that Peter is venerated on the Vatican Hill, Paul on the Via Ostiense. That is a, an older source. It is late second century. Clement and Alessandro is even the thirties of the, the first or the second century. When he wrote in the letter that yeah. there is the two plays of veneration. Yeah, he, he indicates it. Yeah. But but the most the most concrete thing is 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 the late second century, mm. the so-called the, the pr uh, presbyter, so a priest mentioned uh, called uh, Gaius, mm -hmm. who is cited, quoted by Eusebius, and this guy who said, Come to Rome because we have the trophies of the apostle. You can venerate Peter at the Vatican Hill, you can venerate Paul at the Via Ostiense. And that is before the development of the site at the Via uh, Appia, uh, one century before, one a half century before. So to me, there is a continuity of uh, veneration at the Vatican and the Via Ostiense, even if there were some periods that it could not be practiced because of, of persecutions. For instance, halfway the third century, under, it was Valerianus, I think, um, and Decius. And maybe then the Christians had a kind of alternative at the site that was owned by one of their own people, private site, on the Via Appia, with some memory of Peter and Paul. That was a kind of substitution of the mancanza. So uh, you think the double talent translation is too fast as it was? Yeah. It is a little bit too complicated for me mm. to have a translation to the Via Appia and then back to the original places now. But that's where I like the whole event. Yeah. It's abstract, it's narrative. Yeah. Yeah. It's spaces. It's narrative, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. But now that you have the whole lot of land by yourself, what became a who, 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 like, nice way, that really, um, the, 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 
a place in himself is so sacred because it was touched by the horizon, it's always a contact relic. Mm -hmm. And the, the problem of the of Saint Sebastian.